Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Chase Plastics Chase the Knowledge webinar on metal to plastic conversions. My name is Sherry Cutt. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for Chase Plastics. And I want to thank you all for your interest in this webinar and for taking time out of your busy day to attend. A few quick housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, everyone except our presenter, Andrea, is on mute and will be for the duration of the webinar. But if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so anytime by typing it into the questions section of your toolbar. If you'd rather ask your question verbally, uh, just raise your hand in the toolbar and I will unmute you and call on you to ask your question out loud. In addition to our presenter, Andrea Kendrick, I will, who I will introduce here in just a moment, we also have Jason Merkel, technical manager, on hand to answer your questions today. If your question does not get answered right away, we will address it at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can access and download PDF copies of this presentation, our product line card, our metal to plastics one pager, and information on our technical engineering team in the handout section uh, all throughout the presentation. If you are attending live, a certificate of completion and a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you about an hour or two after the webinar concludes. You will receive a separate email from Andrea with a PDF of the presentation and handouts uh, a little bit later this afternoon or tomorrow morning as well. We would greatly appreciate it if you could complete the survey at the end so we can improve future webinars for you and cover the topics that interest you the most. We encourage you to check out past webinars and recordings on the webinars page of our website, and that's at chaseplastics.com backslash webinars. While our next webinar is not yet scheduled, once it is, the registration details will be listed on this page and our social media sites. If, uh, also, if you would like a custom Chase the Knowledge presentation given to your organization discussing a specific topic or material, please send an email to uh, Andrea and she and our entire sales uh, and technical team are always ready to assist with any technical issues, material selection, and educating you and your team on the products and processes specific to your needs. Another great technical resource is the Chase the Knowledge blog on our website. Uh, there are currently six live topics and they can be found at chaseplastics.com backslash blogs or under the resources tab from the homepage. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to our presenter, Andrea Kendrick. Andrea is a technical training engineer with Chase Plastics, and she's been with us since 2015. She received her bachelor's degree in plastics engineering technology from Ferris State University. For those of you who have attended Chase the Knowledge webinars in the past, or contacted our technical engineering team for assistance, you're very familiar with Andrea, and the level of expertise she brings to the table. Without further ado, Andrea. Hey, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Hope all is well. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Today, we're gonna to talk about metal to plastic conversions. Uh, you'll see M2P uh, referenced a lot as the abbreviation to that. So with our agenda today, we're gonna to talk about the conversion, kind of what it means to do that, some advantages, or why we would choose to do such a thing, some hesitation, some things to consider. Then we're gonna go over the process, kind of what that looks like from maybe um, a, a molder's end or a designer's end as we walk through that process. We'll talk about some of the metals that are commonly replaced uh, with plastic. And then we're gonna talk about some of the polymers that are used to replace the metal. We'll talk briefly about it. There are quite a few and really depending on what you're looking to do or what you need to do, uh, there are plenty of options available to achieve what you're looking for. And then lastly, we have a, just a couple slides going over some um, applications that have moved to uh, plastic from metal um, either recently or could be moved uh, just kind of based on, on the requirements and what would be capable out of our plastics. All right, so metal to plastic conversion, um, it 
pretty simple. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're going to take a part that was originally manufactured and made out of metal, and we're going to redesign it and make it out of plastic. And so why would we do that? There's actually quite a few reasons we would look at doing something like that. Uh, the first one would be a decrease in overall production costs. We say overall because there are some other things to consider that if you're looking straight across the line, maybe it's tooling, maybe it's something like that where you might not see that advantage but the overall system cost, your secondary operations, stuff like that, as you start to eliminate those, you'll see an overall reduction of cost total for the process. Uh, weight reduction could be a big one, light weighting. Uh, greater design freedom, which allows for more complex parts to be made out of plastic. Uh, elimination of secondary processes. Parts consolidation. This is a huge component of the overall cost reduction. We're able to make one part that incorporates multiple parts that had to have been made out of metal and then combined somehow. Longer tool life, which is a bigger one, about 10 times-ish compared to cast aluminum tools, so it lasts a lot longer. And then corrosion resistance, which is inherent in plastics. Some of the metals that we talk about do actually have okay corrosion resistance, but plastics in general, great corrosion resistance. You don't have to worry that you're you know, picking the right plastic that's gonna have the resistance, it just does. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more of some of these more in depth so we get a full picture of, of what that all means. Starting with a huge advantage, aesthetics. So this kind of falls into the design freedom, if you will. So the aesthetics of plastics. Plastics can be colored, a whole bunch of different colors. Now granted, you will see a little bit of limitation depending on what material you're using. Maybe it's a really high end, high temperature material. So we're maybe a little limited because the pigments can't achieve that. However, again, still a greater range than you're going to get with metal. Uh, you can also adapt color effects. Maybe you want something that glows in the dark and then you wanna be able to color it that way. Plastics have the ability to do that. Uh, tools can also be made with various surface textures. So maybe you want uh, various textures across the part. Maybe you want a few different textures for the same part and you wanna have options. Uh, and then lastly, stuff like in mold decoration labeling is a huge thing for plastics uh, and it makes their just any plastic part in general a lot more visually appealing than the metal counterparts just because we have so many options for it. These advantages also eliminate secondary operations like painting and lasering the metal parts to achieve even a portion of the appeal that we can achieve with plastic. So again, you're eliminating that secondary operation. You do sometimes um, do a secondary operation with plastics depending on what you're trying to achieve. Maybe uh, you do uh, dip in some ink or something like that, but if you just wanted to make a yellow part that's got a rough surface, you could do that within the mold without having to do any type of secondary operation like you would with metal. Uh, manufacturing and design advantages. So again, plastics are inherently corrosion resistance, resistant, excuse me. And so the metals that aren't, if you need them to have that corrosion resistance, because they're inside some type of application where that could be a problem, you're going to have to coat it either initially, uh, and maybe it's only gonna see it a little bit and we don't have to worry about it, or periodically, maybe you have to continue to coat the metal to continue to protect it. So that's something we don't have to do with plastics, which is great. The other thing is the flexibility within the plastics portfolio. So our range of different plastics that are available, it generally makes it so much easier to switch between plastic types with having to do minimal change to the mold, typically. There's an asterisk there, obviously, if you're moving from maybe a semi-crystalline to an amorphous, you might have to account for mold shrinkage differences and stuff like that. But if you move from you know, a highly engineered, highly filled nylon-based resin to a different highly filled nylon-based resin, you really shouldn't have to do much to change the mold at all to still use that resin in that mold. Whereas if you're going to use a different metal, a complete redesign has to be done. So a lot more flexibility within the realm of plastics. Um, some more manufacturing and design advantages. Plastic parts are produced much quicker. So for those that have a mold with 64 cavities, 32 cavities, you're making a ton of parts very quickly. High level repeatability. You're running cycle after cycle. Um, almost always they are um, uh, continuous. And then also you can automate them. So you've got your end of arm tooling as seen kind of in that picture where you don't have to supervise the process as much. And a lot of times you can get away with very minimal supervision. Maybe you've got just a couple tech guys on the floor and you're running 
you know, 10 plus machines and they're all running parts. So very little supervision is needed, which is, which is ideal. Another thing um, to think about also is plastics are lighter in weight. So this is kind of a big feature we will talk about later on, but their ability to be lighter and to be made into smaller parts means a reduction in weight, size, and thickness. It makes them really ideal in applications and markets where there's a tight space restriction. So your tech device, maybe components of appliances, medical device ones where they gotta you know, roll the device into your room, be able to make smaller, lighter parts makes them ideal for those types of applications where you really do have a limitation for how much space the, the part can take up. And then the big one uh, for part savings, or excuse me, overall system savings, part consolidation. So because you can produce plastic parts with complex geometries, um, and then even so they're complex, you can also have a mold with different inserts. So maybe you want slightly different dimensions, slightly different features. They can all be achieved within the same mold. Metal parts require post-production welding to adhere components like bearings and other supports within the design. So you make your main part and then you have to weld on anything additional to your metal part. So whereas your plastic part is one part, you mold it like that, covers everything you need. This really makes it quite an advantage when you're looking at applications in plumbing, under the hood, filtration, because the big issue in those particular markets or those particular areas is you can't have leakage. So whatever fluid they're moving, it cannot leak to the rest of the system. And so because your plastic part is molded in one piece, you don't have any issue with there potentially being a, a not very superior weld that might end up with leak issues. So again, another huge advantage, plastics over metal here. Uh, just a couple good rules of thumb to consider when you're looking at it. So, you know, you're thinking about it. What, when do I, when should I maybe start thinking about something like this? A good rule of thumb is if you're molding at least, or excuse me, making at least 30,000 parts, it's a really good starting point. Uh, of course, there's other things to consider and we will talk about them as well, but it's a good rule of thumb. If you're only making 1,000, 2,000 parts a year, eh, unless you have the capabilities of a quick turnaround, you do it a lot. You're probably not looking and it's not going to be real easy or cost efficient to make out of plastic or to change the design into plastic. Um, and then another good rule of thumb is shown that on average companies will report a 25 to 50 percent overall, again overall system, savings converting from metal to plastic parts. So real good savings. It's a lot of initial you know getting set up especially if you're at a facility that you know has only done metal and they've ever done injection molding, it's quite a change, but overall huge savings to be had if it's the right part uh, to be made out of plastic. Um, another just fact about metal plastics, um, one thing to think of or, or that we all deal with every day, transportation sector. They've been very successful in doing metal to plastic conversions. They do it specifically for light weighting. So replacing steel or cast iron parts within the body of a car or the chassis with our lighter thermoplastics, they can result in up to a 50% decrease in overall vehicle weight. And so that's a huge difference in weight. And so the ability for the car to extend its range either with battery, if it's an EV car or with gas, so you have huge fuel savings, Huge, 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 especially as we're looking to move towards more fuel efficient vehicles. Plastics is playing a huge part there because we're overall, we're bringing the weight down of the vehicle. So you get the better savings, better miles per gallon and better range with your electrical vehicles. Some, some hesitation. So I kind of just, you know, went through all of these advantages. It probably sounds great, but then you're thinking, well, there's got to be some downsides. There's got to be something that people are a little concerned about. And for sure there are. So the biggest one is going to be your part redesign. And so metal parts as they are designed are not designed for plastic. You almost never can use a design for a metal part and use it as a design for a plastic part. It has to be redesigned. So there's a lot of work that goes into redesigning the part to then make it out of plastic. Uh, the one thing though with that is there's so much software available. You've got your mold flow type software, your FEA type software, where you can do all of these different simulations before you ever cut steel or aluminum for your tool to really tell if it's gonna be an issue or not. So 
Although it is kind of a big pain, you do have to redesign it. There are stuff available to help you without ever having to go and cut anything, change anything. Uh, and then the next one is perceived inferior strength. So a lot of people, um, maybe if you've done metal plastic, you understand that plastics are light, but also quite strong. Some people that have never dealt maybe with plastics and we're trying to look at getting them to, to potentially look at a conversion, they're gonna think, ah, plastics are just, they're not very strong. Metal's a very strong material. We don't have to worry about plastic. But what is convenient, what is very nice is, although metals are very strong, they're also very, very heavy. Whereas your plastics with high reinforcement loading, so your carbon fibers, your glass fibers, we can actually achieve the same or better strength with that lower density because they are lighter. Um, and then the next couple of pages, we're actually talking about specific strength a little bit, which is gonna be the weight compared to its strength against the couple metals. So what does that look like? So if you download the uh, one pager, the metal to plastics one pager that we have, this graph's actually on the back of it. But what it shows you is your tensile strength. So you can see your zinc, your magnesium, your aluminum, very good strengths. Um, though we do have a few highly loaded materials like your PPA and your PARE that actually, even without considering the fact that they're lighter, outperform zinc anyway, which is something pretty awesome to consider. But you'll notice that once you compare it to its weight and you look at the specific tensile strength, which is gonna be your green lines, zinc, not so great. It's a very heavy material. So although it's very strong, it's very, very heavy. So if we compare that to all of our other materials available, they all outperform zinc in that category. So if you're looking for something for light, light weighting and stuff like that, you're obviously not gonna use a zinc type material. Whereas your magnesium and alum aluminum, they do hold a little bit and they're okay still all of our materials will outperform them. So, and then here's the same information um, just in a, in a table form. So you can really see the values here. So if you're looking between the HPPA down all the way to a PPA, we'll touch briefly on kind of what all those are, but you'll notice that the specific strength much, much higher than your zinc that's down all the way at 35. So it's not performing nearly as well. Magnesium does okay. Um, and it actually in specific strength outperforms PPS. Uh, just a little bit, but compared to all of the other materials, it does not. So our plastics, lighter, but also still very strong. All right, so now we've kind of talked about advantages, some reasons we would be a little hesitant to do it. Now let's talk about the actual process itself. What do we do? What do we go through when we are thinking, hey, this might be a good idea? What does that process look like? What do we have to go through to determine, cool, let's do it, can we do it? Let's move towards doing it. So the first step is gonna be reviewing your part and the suitability for metal to plastic conversion. So you need to understand, is this part that we're making suitable for metal to plastic conversion? Would it make sense to make it out of plastic? So the good candidate for something like that is gonna be high volume production. So we mentioned 30,000 plus parts, especially if it's even higher, you have the chance of even better cost savings if you're making a lot more. Uh, if it's a part that's pretty complex or it gets assembled where you can eliminate some of the secondary operations uh, or consolidate some of the parts. So if you make one part and then you weld on three additional parts, is there the potential that you could mold all of them out of plastic instead? Uh, require light weighting or a more diverse design or aesthetic options. So again, we talked very, uh, in depth about the different color and texture options of your plastic, you need a little more design freedom or just light weighting in general, it's gotta be lighter. So this is kind of where we're gonna go with that. We're gonna start looking at plastic options. The next part would be to define your part requirement. So we're now at this point we've determined, I think this would be a great option for metal to plastic. The next thing is to define what do we need this plastic to do to make sure we're still hitting and, and the part will perform as needed? So we need to understand the environment that the part is in. What is the temperature gonna be like? Is it outside seeing UV? Is it gonna see a lot of chemicals? Is it a heavy moisture rich environment where there's gonna be a lot of moisture in the air depending on where it's at? And so all of these things will affect our plastic products. So we need to know uh, what type of environment it will see. The next is gonna be your mechanical performance. Obviously a big one, your metals are used because they're strong and they're stiff. So we need to know what level of strength and stiffness is required and maybe even impact requirements as well if, if that's needed. And then any type of special requirements, regulatory, does it need to have any type of wear properties? Are we gonna need to color it, sort of flame retardancy? Are we gonna use it for any type of um, 
is, is it used to conduct anything? Because we would need to get a material that would meet all of that and have the ability to do that. So once we understand uh, if it's a good option for metal to plastic, and then we understand what we need the material to do, then we can start to really dive deep into an actual cost analysis to see if we're going to save money by doing this overall. And so the things that you're gonna look at, again, you wanna look at the entire system because not just one item will give you the full picture. We wanna look at our material costs and the density, uh, which is important for, uh, well, plastic specifically we do buy based on weight, and then also for shipping. So we make these parts, they're really heavy, made out of metal, it's gonna cost us more to ship them. So we would save on shipping as well, if we make it out of plastic. Then we're also gonna look at the tooling and processing information, tool life expectancy. So if we've got a part that you know we need to run for 10, 20 years, and the tool only lasts a couple of years, well, we're gonna have to factor in the fact we're gonna have to replace it. Whereas your plastic tooling is gonna last a lot longer for more shots. And we'll look at cycle times, so you can make more parts quicker. Assembly steps and labor, and then kind of hand in hand with that, your secondary operations. So your welding, your painting, your coating, stuff that you likely have to do with your metal part, that depending on what you're doing with it when you make it out of plastic, you're not going to. So that's where you're gonna see quite a savings as well in that area. So another couple uh, considerations within that realm. So we talked about understanding the requirements. A big one and a big point I wanted to make, uh, and I didn't want to just you know skip over it, is going to be creep. Creep is a huge factor to consider uh, with your design. So if it's a structural part that's meant to just hold its form, it can't deform, we can't have any issue, maybe it's seeing a load. It's something we need to consider when we're looking at our materials. And the other big factor within that is that metal plastics, they're gonna creep a little bit, uh, but really across the range of temperatures, it's not gonna creep much different. It's gonna be pretty consistent across the range of temperatures. Our plastics, however, are affected by the changing temperatures. So if you're seeing something from, you know, if it's just a room temperature type application, then it's gonna be more affected by, you know, the time and, and the uh, load versus if it's seeing a range of temperatures, it gets all the way up to 200, 300, 400 F, it's gonna creep differently and quicker than if it was at the lower temperature. So again, something we need to consider as we're looking at the whole picture of what we can do with our material. Uh, and so if, if you're not familiar, your creep deformation is gonna cause a change in dimension. So if this is a part that's holding something or it has moving mechanisms or something within it, if it changes dimension, it's highly likely it's also then going to fail and the part's no longer gonna work correctly. So we can't have that. So we need to make sure, again, it's one of those things that we're understanding the environment and what's expected out of it. Because if we're not hitting that or not able to hit it, then it makes it a no-go for a conversion. So, and the second portion just says, we need to know the temperature, we need to know the strength and stiffness information, because all of this is going to be what we determine Yes, it's achievable or no, there's too much load at too high of a temperature, a plastic won't perform. So again, one of those things we got to consider to make sure we can actually do the conversion into plastic. And then I wanted to show a couple graphs. Um, again, I mentioned how metals across the different temperatures, the creep doesn't change much, plastics do. So I have a couple graphs to kind of show you that briefly. So if you're looking at this one, it's a 40% glass filled PPS. So if you look at it, it's for a hundred hours, all the same. The only difference is the changing temperature. So if you look, you can kind of see this one here is your room temperature, so kind of consistent. And then as soon as it starts getting hotter, it starts to fail earlier. And so again, problem, if we don't know the temperature or if it's in a higher temperature range, could cause problems. Um, this one just shows kind of consistent over the time. It's gonna creep, you're gonna have some change. And so we, we know that. And then same thing uh, for temperature, um, or excuse me, for time. Shows different hour, 10 hour. So anyway, creep is one of those things we need to make sure we understand. We know that we're kind of designing for and we're within an acceptable range if we were to use the plastic material to see that. And then also we have the availability of, of certain data to kind of show for different materials how they're going to perform as well. So that way you kind of know ahead of time what to expect. Okay, and then back to the process. So step number four, 
So now the big thing, uh, the one that we mentioned gives quite a bit of hes hesitation, is your redesign. So you need to review the part design. We need to design it for a plastic part. So the big thing is going to be focusing on different portions of a plastic design that you don't necessarily focus on with metal. So your draft, your radii, your wall thickness, where we're putting the gate, those are all things that need to be considered and they need to be done right uh, to make a good material that's going to pass. It's not gonna have issues. So. We need our proper draft for part ejection. So you don't want to make a part and then not be able to get out of the mold. That would be quite a pain and then you can't automate it, all sorts of issues. Uh, the next one would be your radii and ribs. Um, and so ribs would be a design feature that you can utilize to help give you a boost in strength without having to add too much to the overall part weight. Uh, so that's a, a nice advantage of plastics in that regard. You can design it that way. So you can still maintain a lot of strength and stiffness. Uh, but also we wanna make sure we're not having unnecessary areas of stress. So that would be particular to stuff like your radii. If you don't have them, you're gonna have a, an area of stress there if you have a sharp corner. Uh, and then wall thickness is gonna be a huge one. So we wanna make sure that we're using as uniform of wall thickness as we can. If we have non-uniform wall thickness, we can have filling, shrinkage, in mold stress issues. Uh, which is going to cause you to create an inferior product which is not what we want and then lastly your gate location we want to make sure that we um, select the right location for it so it's going to determine how the molecules are going to orient and how it's going to flow through your mold so properly locating that is really important we want to make sure we don't have any filling void or sink mark issues so got to make sure that we're doing that and really overall the big point here is going to be again they have software available so we create a design we have it all ready we have software to simulate if it's going to work or not, which is great because we don't have to cut any steel. We don't have to do any of that yet. We've been able to determine if we think it will work or not before we've done any of the actual cutting of steel and committing to a mold, which is great. And then just the last couple steps, prototyping. So maybe we decide we're just gonna do an aluminum tool. We'll prototype, we'll make a certain amount of parts and then we'll validate it. So now we gotta go through all the testing and any type of real world testing that the metal parts had gone through do the same thing in your plastic to make sure it's withstanding whatever it needs to, just based on the requirement of the part itself. Um, and then preparing your tooling process and design for production. And then lastly, we cut the steel, we make production molds, we start making our plastic parts, and we're gonna benefit from our faster processing, our end of arm tooling for automation, elimination of the secondary processes, uh, because we've made a part now out of plastic instead of out of metal. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the different metals that we replace. So we talked about the process, we know why we'll do it, we'll know the advantages. So now let's talk about the metals a little bit briefly so we understand them. So the big ones are gonna be aluminum, again, magnesium and, and zinc. Aluminum is your most common. Uh, it's lightweight and structural. Uh, and mind you, all of these are alloys, so they have different kind of, you can have slightly different makeups, so they all fall into different ranges of performance, uh, similar with, I guess our materials too, they might have different additives or stuff that kind of make them a little different, so different alloys. Um, aluminum is resistant to corrosion, which is nice uh, because then at least in the, and we'll talk about it briefly, in the lower hardness, uh, or excuse me, lower tensile grades, they don't have to do a coating because it is resistant. Uh, it will maintain strength at high temperatures, which is great if it's a structural part at high temperature environment. It's the most economical non-ferrous material. Uh, and it's commonly made into beverage cans, HVAC components, pieces of your smartphone, and also automotive components. So used very commonly. Uh, magnesium alloys, they're lightweight and structural. They're actually the lightest of, of these ones that we would use. It has a high tensile yield strength. The one issue it does have, or I guess a few, if we talk about all the benefits of plastic over them, but the big one would be that as a lower modulus than your aluminum or zinc, so it's more prone to bending. So if you have an issue where it's gonna be really structural, it can't bend, we can't have any of that happening, uh, there's a potential it could be an issue. Some of the common uh, products, it's, it's some components within car seats, power tools, luggage, and high-end bike frames are made out of magnesium alloys. And then last one that we'll talk about, zinc alloys. It's the heaviest of the metals. So as we touched on briefly in the chart, uh, it is a very heavy, uh, product and material, uh, so it is not used for your lightweight applications. It has excellent corrosion resistance. It has better impact strength than magnesium or aluminum though. So although heavy, it does have better impact. So if that's a requirement of the application, we might be looking to use it either. 
also. And another thing is that it has a longer tool life because we can run it cooler. So that's convenient as well because it does actually last a lot more shots than some of the other materials. Some common products are going to be plumbing parts, bushings, bearings, and electrical light housings. It's commonly made out of zinc alloys. So some pitfalls. So outside of the advantages of using plastic over it, some of the pitfalls of these specific materials, aluminum has a low hardness. So it's not going to be very good for abrasion and wear resistant type uh, parts. You'd have to coat it if you wanted to see an improvement there, which is an additional step. It's an additional secondary operation that we can eliminate with not having to do that with our plastics. We have plastics that would be good for wear and friction applications. Um, they have a wide range of tensile strength, anywhere from the lower end at 70 all the way up to 700 MPa. However, as the strength increases, your corrosion resistance decreases. So if you want the high strength, it's available, get your high-end aluminum alloy. However, you will have to coat it then if it's going to be an environment where corrosion will be an issue because it loses its corrosion resistance at the higher tensile strengths. Magnesium has low chemical and corrosion resistance. So again, it's gonna to have to be coated if you want to not have that be a problem. It also has low hardness as well. And so not so good in abrasion and wear type applications. Again, if you wanna improve that, you're gonna to have to coat it. And then zinc, it's the heaviest one here. We've talked about that one being the biggest problem. So obviously not usable for lightweight applications. Um, and then also its impact, which we said was a, a kind of a big thing for it, you start to lose that if your temperatures start getting kind of low. So you lose the impact performance, which is similar for some plastics materials as well if you get really cold, uh, but it loses its impact, which is a mean, one of the main features. Uh, so we talked about not as many shots, the tools don't last as long. So this kind of gives you an idea of the expectation for number of cycles that you can run. Um, obviously, if it's a different alloy, different hardness, a little bit different, so it might range, but this is just an overall idea to see how they perform. So magnesium, you're gonna have the least amount of shots available out of your tool, so you get about 150,000-ish. Aluminum, about 300,000, so double that of magnesium. And then zinc up to 450, so three times as much as magnesium. But plastics, we can easily get over a million cycles. Now granted, stuff like you're really highly filled or stuff that's really abrasive, maybe not, uh, as many as if you're just using maybe an unfilled nylon, an unfilled propylene, something like that, you'll get a lot more cycles at it. But regardless, the tool is going to last longer than any of your metal tools will. So there's an advantage there for sure. So we talked a lot about light weighting, but still being able to, if we design it right, maintain stiffness. So all of this on this page to say, if we took just a rectangular block of aluminum die cast and we were to figure out the rigidity there and the weight, we'd be looking at about 3.9 million for your rigidity at about 2.7 grams. So doesn't sound too crazy, but when we redesign it into plastic, you'll notice the area is larger, so it is. We're, there's more area to it. It's a bigger uh, part, if you will. Um, and we can actually, with this material, with the redesign and all of that, our rigidity is also 3.9 because we use, uh, because of the design feature for it, but our weight is only 1.64. So we, again, the rigidity, very similar, 3.9, but we have almost a 40% reduction in weight. So again, light weighting, big thing here. We kept the rigidity, which is a big thing, stiffness, strength, all that but you see the reduction in weight. So great bit of information there. So we talked about the metals. We talked about, you know, why would we choose them? So now I wanna just talk briefly on the different materials. As you can see on our high end, so these is what I would consider our high end, high stiffness, high strength type products for offsetting uh, metals. Um, obviously stuff like you could use a PA6, you could use a PA66, you could use a PBT. It really just depends on what you need out of the material. But if you need those really high performing, really high stiffness and strength options, these are gonna be the ones that we look at. Very, very high end, um, very high performing materials that are gonna give you very good properties and performance. And so we'll touch on each of them just briefly. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, the one pager for metal to plastic also has a table that shows all the different options with some information on them as well. So the first four that we're gonna talk about are gonna be your polyamide your nylon based variants. So high performance uh, polyamide. So this is gonna be also kind of a partially aromatic nylon. Um, 
the one thing that you'll see is the one column for water moldable. This is ideal for if you are going to be working or you're helping maybe an end user move over and do a metal to plastic redesign for them and you don't have oil or the capabilities to run oil maybe yet, where you don't really wanna to have to do that. There are some high-end, high stiffness and strength products where you don't have to run oil. So that is an advantage there. So you'll notice the HPPA, the partially aromatic, and some grades of PPA do not require that you run oil. You can get away with hot water. And so that can be an advantage there in those materials. Um, and then you'll see the surface appearance uh, section. They're gonna look a little bit shinier, a little bit better than metal to begin with but then to compare them within the families, your PARA and your partially aromatic polyamides are gonna have very nice surface appearance. And we'll talk about that briefly uh, in a couple slides, but good surface appearance. And then I also included the flexural modulus. So you can kind of get an idea of, of where the stiffness is for each material. Um, these are gonna be based on kind of the highest level grade. So either a really high glass loading or really high maybe carbon fiber loading where you get the highest performance there. So just to give you a comparison of kind of where we can get. And then some advantages, stuff like your HPPA is, um, it's got excellent colorability, you can color it nicely. Some of these materials that we'll talk about have kind of a, a, a starting color or tint that make them a little more difficult to color. Uh, so your, your PEIs, your PPSs, they have a slight amber and tan color to them. So they're a little more difficult to color. You can do it for sure, you just maybe won't get the very vibrant colors. So HPPA and the partial aromatic are gonna be good for coloring. You can color them a lot of different options, which is great. And really all of these options, it is mentioned a few times, but really all of these options are gonna perform better in moisture absorption in terms that it doesn't pick up as much compared to your six or six six. So these higher end ones are better for that. Um, stuff like higher heat and lower moisture uptake for the HPPA. Your partially aromatic are going to be great for paintability and weatherability. Uh, there's actually um, a couple grades that are have excellent weatherability. Um, your PARAs, beautiful surface appearance. Again, we'll talk about it a little bit more briefly. Again, higher elevated temperatures, higher performance. And then your PPAs, which is nice. It is a family of, of different resins within that family within that um, category but you have low moisture uptake. It maintains its mechanicals at elevated temperatures really nicely. Um, and then there's also a range of temperature performance. That's why some grades can be oil molded and some can be water molded, um, as well as um, a lot of different options as you change them have varying levels of moisture uptake. Again, still all better though than your six and your six six. Okay, and then we're we'll talking about the non-polyamide variants. So all of the nylon variants are gonna be semi-crystalline materials. So if you've been around for a couple of my other presentations, you know your semi-crystalline materials uh, typically have a little bit better uh, heat resistance, chemical resistance, um, generally a little bit better wear and friction because of, of the, uh, the crystal regions. And so the peak and the PPS on this page are also semi-crystalline. So they also kind of fall into that category as well. And then we also have a couple that are gonna be amorphous. So your PESU and your PEI are also used in metal to plastic replacement. Again, just depends on what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to do. So the nice thing about a handful of the ones on this page are gonna be actually all of them on this page is they're all inherently V0 or flame retardant. So they're gonna self extinguish. And so if that's a requirement, uh, it could be around maybe a flame or, or something that could cause uh, it to try to light. All these materials are gonna be inherently flame resistant without having to add anything to them. So that's a, a nice advantage as well of these materials. Uh, your PPS is gonna be decent surface appearance here. Most of those are glass filled. Um, it's not as common to get a non glass filled, but a lot of different options, a lot of different availabilities of different materials within these families. But these are kind of the main families that we would look out for this type of stuff. None of these are water moldable. They're all high end, high temperature ones. You have to mold them with oil, unfortunately. So if you don't have that capability, we're never gonna recommend that you run it lower. And we'll talk about it also a little briefly. We talk about the plastic downfalls. Um, some other stuff, your peak material, it's gonna have excellent chemical resistance. And so, and also excellent chemical resistance at high temperatures. So if the environment is uh, at elevated temperature and it's gonna see certain chemicals, excellent performance there. Your PPS, same, very, very great chemical resistance, great, great performance. Low moisture uptake for this one, specifically because PPS is non-hygroscopic. The glass and the sizing agents used in it will try to pick up a little bit of moisture, but the actual base resin itself 
does not pick up moisture. So really low moisture uptake for PPS, which is convenient. Uh, and then your two amorphous materials, um, they're actually clear. So you can see through them. So that's a requirement. Now granted your metals, clearly you don't see through them, but maybe this is an advantage then when you redesign it because you then can see through them. Um, your PEIs and your peak type materials would be FST compliant. So flame, smoke, and toxicity. So if you're using them and, and that's a requirement, maybe it's an aerospace part or something where you need to have low flame, low smoke and toxicity, um, those materials would pass that. So again, another advantage there as well. And then those particular ones, your amorphous materials, because they don't shrink as much, excellent dimensional stability. So very good dimensional stability, um, very low uh, chance of warpage. It's never zero, but a lot lower um, and excellent dimensional stability out of those two materials as well, which is great. Some considerations, some things to think about when we're looking at plastics specifically. So your surface appearance, again, we've touted that the aesthetics available out of plastics compared to metal is great. Some things to consider, your semi-crystalline materials. So of the ones I, I mentioned, all but your PESU and PEI, you're generally gonna get above average surface appearance, even with high glass loadings. So then I mentioned, I talk about the other two materials again. So your PARA and your partially aromatic, so your 666i materials, you can achieve a class A surface unpainted even with very high glass loadings. So it does a great job of burying the glass and giving you a nice smooth glossy surface. So excellent surface. When you look at, if you've not seen a plaque or a part made out of those materials uh, and it's something that's interests you, I would definitely reach out and ask about it. They're beautiful surface. You almost couldn't, uh, it's almost impossible to even tell that it's got you know 50% glass in it beautiful surface. You can also achieve really good surface with PPAs, but generally at lower glass loadings. It doesn't hide the glass as well as the other materials do. We talked briefly about UV stability and how some of the aromatic grades had really good stability. Overall, your cell phones, not great UV resistance. So if you're going to make a part and it has to sit outside, we're probably not looking at those options. Um, and if we are, we're you know maybe adding additive to it to stabilize it. We're also probably going to lose the clarity at that point. So maybe that was an advantage we were looking at. Now we might be giving that up to get the UV resistance. Uh, PEI materials generally have really good, pretty good UV um, resistance. And then a lot of these other materials can um, be stabilized, so you get good performance. But overall, the majority of these materials will maintain their properties after UV exposure. So if it sits outside and you test it for maybe tensile retention or impact, uh, it will retain its properties well but you might have where the appearance will suffer. So if you're using it in its natural form or you colored it, you might see a shift in color and that's where you'll see a problem. And you might consider it not as UV stable because of that. But if the main concern, which for high-end products, typically it's as long as it's still performing as it should, these materials will do that. Um, the big issue would be if it's not stabilized and it is exposed to UV and it's a highly filled product, they'll start to kind of rough up the surface and start to expose some of the glass. So what would have been a very beautiful surface, now you're exposing the glass, it's not as, it's not as nice of a surface as you originally had. And then processing and tool temps. So again, we talked about the different grades, if they're hot water moldable or oil moldable. If they're not hot water moldable, anything above 100 C, uh, which is your 212, we're gonna start to look at using oil. And specifically because water starts to turn into steam at that point. So we need to use oil to run at the higher temperatures. So what happens is any of those products that have to use oil to run, um, if you run them colder than we recommend, you start to get very high molded in stress because you're kind of freezing it off earlier than you should. A lot of dimensional instability because it's not going to fill correctly or it's gonna try to, and maybe the flow front will freeze off. So there's a few things that can happen. And really the big one, awful, awful surface appearance. So if you take any of these semi crystalline materials and you run them too cold, you're effectively gonna make an amorphous a version of it, which then loses all of its properties that make it perform the way that it does. Maybe you were using it for chemical, maybe you're using it for heat, maybe you're using it for wear and friction. If you make an amorphous version of the resin, it's losing a lot of that property performance. So you don't wanna take a nice, plus if we're being honest, they're not you know, the cheapest of materials. So we don't wanna be running them and not making good parts anyway. So we wanna make sure that we're running them at the appropriate temperatures to make real good quality products. All right, so just a couple brief pages, just talking about some of the stuff that could or has been 
uh, through a metal to plastic replacement. Um, different housings, covers, and structural parts. So these ones happen to be automotive versions. So maybe an oil pump housing, thermostat housing, engine front covers, transmission covers, support frames, headlight lamp frames, real structural parts that are holding stuff that are made out of metal that we could potentially make them out of plastic. Because again, we have high strength and stiffness plastic parts to perform similarly. And then industrial type parts, irrigation pumps, filter housings, coffee machine covers or coffee machine components, because we've got the high temperature, the structural parts, uh, pump casing or covers, oven parts, furniture components, maybe parts of you know chairs, stuff like that, that would have to hold really good structure and form. We could replace it with plastic as well. So just a couple of options to kind of think about when you're seeing them, picturing them, they're in metal, there's the potential they could be made out of plastic. So, but with that, that is what I had for you guys, uh, going over metal to plastic. All right, thank you, Andrea, for your comprehensive presentation, as always. Um, if you have any questions, like we've said, go ahead and type those into the questions section, and we will answer those now. Um, or if you'd like to raise your hand, if you'd like uh, to speak your question out loud, I will unmute your microphone and you can uh, ask your question at that time. We do have Jason Merkel, technical manager, who has been with Chase Plastics since 2012, on hand to assist Andrea with questions today. Um, as a reminder, as you type your questions, please complete the survey at the end of this webinar. Your responses will help shape future Chase the Knowledge webinars, and we welcome your feedback. Um, also, be sure to check out our new blog page at chaseplastics.com backslash blogs, and past webinar recordings and future webinar announcements are at chaseplastics.com backslash webinars. Um, if you'd like to have a custom Chase the Knowledge topic presented to your organization, please reach out to Andrea, uh, Andrea Kendrick, who is your presenter today. Um, Jason, does it look like we have any questions? Yeah, we've got a few things to cover. Um, let's see here. Uh, more, more of a comment than a question, but it does bear repeating. Um, when we were talking about tooling, uh, and the fact that most times you're going to have to redesign a part to make it uh, out of plastic rather than metal. Um, there is one um, area you can focus on that can make things a little easier that that if you're converting, especially from a die cast product, if you have any obsolete tooling from the pre-existing metal part, um, at times you can retrofit the die cast component tooling to be injection moldable. Um, Typically not perfect, but definitely suffices as first shots or proof of concept. So that's one way to save money uh, when you are converting from metal to plastic and want to see, you know, how close you can come to the metal performance with the plastic component. So thank you for bringing that up, Tom. Um, one other notable mention is that um, highly filled polypropylene is another material we didn't talk about today. Uh, 40 to 50 percent glass fiber filled propylene. Um, both short glass fiber and long glass fiber have been used successfully in metal replacement applications. Um, one of the reasons we didn't highlight it too much here is that compared to some of the more uh, highly engineered products we, we mentioned today, you, you typically give up a little more when it comes to a propylene compound, whether that be tensile strength or heat performance, uh, abrasion resistance, things of that nature, where you know maybe a PPS or a cell phone or PEI, you're not sacrificing quite as much. But um, that being said, uh, the reason we asked so many questions at the beginning of a metal to plastic conversion is to figure out how, how low you know, in the plastics engineering pyramid we can go to save cost and, and effort at the end of the day. And um, filled polypropylene has certainly been used successfully in the past. Um, at times, even unfilled product like ABS and polycarbonate has been used to replace metal. So we try to really understand the CTQs of a given application as early as possible to point you guys in the right direction when it comes to material selection. Um, one question uh, also came up about the relative cost of the plastics that we discussed. Um, I will say that unfortunately, neither Andrea nor myself um, really see too much in the, in the realm of pricing. Um, I don't know um, the, the cost of metals, but 
probably what would be ideal to do, Brian, would be to get in touch with your account manager and we'll do that for you and have them send you over some ballpark costs from the two reels we're discussing. Um, I mean, ballpark, you know, field pro polypropylenes could be anywhere from the, the $2 range to get into PPSs and PPAs. You're going to be upwards of like the $5 per pound. And then specialty products like the EI and the cell phones, you're most likely upwards of $10 per pound, depending on the volume usage annually. And then if you had to go all the way up to peak, you're talking economies of scale different um, up to, you know, the $50 per pound range. So quite the wide array, um, which is why we want to focus on product performance needs first and foremost, and then work to find the most affordable option for you. I would say from just putting this together and my understanding, your metals are, in my understanding, fairly cheap compared to the plastics potentially. So it's the over, and that's why we kept reiterating the overall system cost um, difference. So if you were to just look at the price of materials, if your metals are cheaper, you're obviously not going to you're not gonna see an advantage there. But overall, because you're eliminating processes and maybe you know, you're making one part where there used to be three, that's where you see your savings. One additional question, Andrea, is has your team 3D printed any of these metal to plastic resins as part of uh, the process? Uh, we have not done any of these high-end ones. Um, those require special 3D printing uh, machines that can mold at such high temperatures. We do have a 3D printer though, and, and we've done other, I guess you kind of consider maybe lower end products. So we've done uh, PETs, we've done some different lower end nylons, we've done stuff like that where we have 3D printed um, those, but we don't have a 3D printer for the really high temperature PEIs, peaks, we, we aren't able to do that. So our team is not, um, I'm sure some of our customers have that have that capability and do stuff like that. Uh, they certainly can, we sell to, customers that also do that, where they'll 3D print uh, high-end resins. We do not ourselves, though. Yeah, just to further upon that, uh, to Andrea's point, it, it certainly can be done. Um, you know, there's there are printers out there that can handle all tem type products, um, sometimes which are carbon filled when it comes to, to filament uh, or other versions of 3D printing. Um, so it, it can be done. We don't have the capability to do it in-house, but um, theoretically, if you were looking to prototype some of these designs via 3D printing, um, there are options out there. And even, you know, it, it might not be P PPS, but we've seen PPS replacements in filament form. Um, cell phone products absolutely can be printed in some cases. So um, the machinery becomes the limiting factor because when you're trying to heat such highly engineered, high melt temperature materials in a tiny print head, it gets rather complicated, but uh, it can be done, just we don't have the capability here in-house. All right, and it looks like uh, Marie had mentioned, Marie Franz had mentioned uh, something there at the bottom there, Jason. Yeah, we uh, and just further to that point, we do have some high temperature filaments available um, through our portfolio. So if that is something you guys wanted to look further into, you can either contact Andrea or your account manager specifically, and uh, we'd be happy to let you know what options we have or, or may be available in the market. All right, and Dan, I see you had a question on uh, getting a copy of the PowerPoint. It is in the handout section. Uh, of your toolbar if you look under handouts there's it should say four out of five and one of those is the presentation but you will receive an email from andrea as well um, with a copy of the presentation as well as the other handouts that are attached there and it looks like we don't have any further questions so we would like to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this chase the knowledge webinar uh, we hope it was informative and a great return on the investment of your time. If you have any technical questions that did not get answered today, feel free to reach out to Andrea directly. Her information is posted on your screen. Uh, thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you at our next Chase the Knowledge webinar. We wish you and your families all a safe and joyous holiday season. Thank you.